Good morning, everyone. Again, I think we should get started. Welcome to the first IPSS policy dialogue session for the year 2021, and I wish you all a very happy new year. Uh, we're going to have this briefing session with the support of USIP. It will be on investing in children and youth and its nexus with silencing the gun. So Professor Lai Zaglami will be your host for today. Without further ado, I leave the floor to you. Professor Lai, you have, you have the floor and thank you very much for being our host for today. Enjoy thank the session. So, Bye. Thank you so much, Robert, for giving me the honor to moderate uh, this webinar. I'm so happy and uh, pleased uh, to uh, lead this uh, webinar. Uh, good morning, everyone. Good morning, Africa. Good afternoon. Good uh, uh, evening, wherever you are uh, from all over the world, and particularly from Africa. Uh, today, our uh, uh, our uh, thematic is very, very important because it deals with uh, the, the the place and the role of children uh, and, uh, of course, youth uh, in relation to uh, uh, this uh, horrible problem of silencing the guns. Uh, just uh, to, remind, to kindly remind you, uh, of course, you are kindly asked to switch off your micro and the camera when you are not uh, uh, intervening. Uh, of course, you have, you can raise your hand or there is a frame where you can uh, ask the question or write the message. And uh, uh, just to give you some, uh, some clue about today's uh, uh, seminar, uh, right now we have 226 million youth between 15 and 24 uh, years in Africa. In 2030, they will be 20% of the population. And uh, of course, it's so important to remind also ourselves, uh, children and youth of today are adults of tomorrow. That's the importance of uh, stressing on the role of young population. Uh, regarding the silencing the gun issue, uh, which uh, as you may have already read the literature regarding this topic, so between 1990 and two, two, 2015, there are 600, 630 armed conflicts. And uh, uh, around, uh, uh, and of course, uh, those involved are actors, no, uh, it uh, has nothing to do with the state, no state actors with 75% 75, 75 are involved in armed, uh, in, in conflict in Africa. More, more, more importantly, we have over 40 million small guns within the uh, uh, civilian population. And the, the, the very horrible case is within Libya, which got about 23 million small, uh, small guns around. This is to explain to how explosive, how uh, horrible the situation in, uh, uh, is in Africa particularly. And uh, to talk about this uh, uh, issue, I am so pleased to have a bunch of uh, outstanding uh, 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 professor, expert, and uh, of course, uh, uh, analyst and doctor. And uh, of course, everyone has to speak around 15 minutes. And then, of course, uh, as you may see in the program, we start with Dr. Rhus Ako, who is senior analyst in con and specialist in conflict preven prevention and early warning division the, from the Department of Peace and Security of the African Union. Then the second uh, uh, speaker is uh, Mrs. Doris um, um, Pumu. She is director and uh, African Union representative, Save the Children International. And the last, uh, uh, of course, is Natalie Sonia Mukandan, executive chairman, African Youth uh, Commission. Uh, without uh, any delay, I hand off to Dr. Rus Ako. The floor is yours. Are you, Thank you, are very you much. there? My pleasure is yours. Okay, go ahead, my friend. Thank you very much, uh, Lahid, and uh, good morning. Uh, again, good afternoon, good, good evening, everybody, wherever you are. Uh, as Lahid has said, my name is uh, Dr. Rooks Ako, and I'm a senior analyst with the Conflict Prevention and Early Warning Division of the African Union uh, Peace and Security Department, uh, where I also uh, co convene uh, the Youth for Peace Africa program, which is uh, focused on uh, integrating uh, youth into uh, Africa's peace and security agenda. Uh, I'll be speaking mostly today regarding uh, the activities that the Youth for Peace program has uh, engaged in uh, since uh, 2018, uh, November 2018 to be precise, when the program was uh, inaugurated. Uh, before I go into that, I'd also like to uh, quickly 
uh, thank uh, IPSS as well as their partners USIP for, for again highlighting this important topic of uh, youth uh, involvement in silencing the guns. Uh, maybe to start with is to say if a few words on silencing the guns. Uh, I, like every most of most of us would know, uh, this is a flagship program of uh, the African Union's Agenda 2063, where it aims to you know push the ideal of uh, the nexus between peace and development. Uh, it's not simply uh, a program where active wars and conflicts are in sight, but also uh, the root causes of uh, these conflicts as well. In other words, it seeks to ensure or promote uh, peace uh, on the continent as a prerequisite for its uh, sustainable development. Last year, 2020, uh, the African Union dedicated uh, the theme uh, of silencing the guns, and this was again to um, highlight the, the importance of this uh, flagship program within the continent, and also to you know bring focus to what it means, what it aims to achieve, and also to take stock of the progress that has been made, um, and again to reflect on how uh, to take this forward uh, up till 20. 30 as decided by uh, the assembly. Uh, let me start off by speaking about the youth in Africa. There's been a misnomer that young women and men in Africa are synonymous with trouble, that they are more or less engaged in activities of uh, violent extremism, um, irregular migration, and, and those sort of things. However, my experience in the last three years has suggested otherwise because I have had to interact with, you know, hundreds of thousands of young African women and men that are doing tremendous things, sometimes without any support from formal institutions such as governments, regional institutions, uh, businesses, corporate bodies, and they are doing fantastic work. And I think this is, you know, what we should be thinking of benchmarking and improving upon. When I looked at this concept note to talk about investing in youth, I think the first thing I thought about was invest what? And I think with these sort of discussions, it's always important to reflect on the value of investments other than financial investment. We can pick up budgets and we can see allocations of, you know, funds without results. The point I'm trying to make here is that we should also look at investments as going beyond uh, throwing money into a process. The African Union has always recognized the role of young people, and I think this goes to way back to the African Youth Charter, which predates uh, the, the UN uh, Security Council resolutions on youth, both 2250 and 2419. But more recently, in 2018, with the inauguration of the Youth for Peace Africa program, there has been a tremendous progress in the recognition of the value that young women and men in Africa bring to peace and security. At the, at the inaugural of the program, young people themselves tasked us with what they felt at the time were their priorities and what they would like to see the program uh, bring to them. In other words, the investment that they wanted to see dividends therefrom. And just to mention a few of these things, this was one to, to, to help correct the wrong but then dominant narrative that youth were synonymous with uh, negative uh, issues. Two, to help develop a holistic framework within which stakeholders would have a concerted and common approach in dealing with uh, youth. Um, they also wanted um, help in terms of building their capacities to be able to do more to function optimally in the peace and security uh, arena. Tasked with this, 
we use for peace program then sought um, the intervention of the AU's Peace and Security Council, which we know is, um, you know, the highest decision-making body in terms of peace and security on the continent. And uh, same year, the first youth open session at the PSC was held, and some landmark decisions came out from that session. The PSC tasked the, the, the commission to conduct a study on the roles and contributions of youth to peace and security in Africa. Secondly, it tasked the, the commission to speedily complete work on the continental framework on youth, peace and security, and also to select uh, Africa Youth Ambassadors for Peace. Since that decision was made in 2018, I can tell you categorically that PSC has endorsed the study which was completed. The study was endorsed in uh, June last year. It also adopted the continental framework on youth peace and security and a 10 year implementation plan to, to, to you know, ensure that this framework does not just remain on the shelves. Building on this uh, policy developments, what are the other or actual investments in ensuring that these policies come to life from the African Union? First and foremost, with regards um, the I beg your pardon. First and first and foremost, as with regards the continental framework on youth peace and security and the study, we've translated these documents to the five languages, uh, and this includes Swahili, uh, to ensure that we can reach every hook and cranny of the continent. We have ensured that we're doing uh, infographics. To also, this is to also ensure that we're able to pass the messages to all stakeholders without them necessarily having to read a bulky document. And these are very important documents and we feel that these are the things that the stakeholders need to engage with to further their interaction with young people who are already doing so much in promoting peace in their communities. Knowing the difficulties in pushing these documents to reality, there are certain mechanisms that have been integrated into them. The 10-year implementation plan has some target milestones. There's a reporting to the PSC annually on what has been done with regards implementing uh, the, the, the framework and the, the action plans. There's the midterm review, which will be held on the fifth anniversary of the adoption of the framework. This will be in 2024, and then the progress report at its 10th anniversary. What is also being done is to uh, ensure that the two documents are taken all over. And by this I mean to ensure that those who need them, those who require them to change the narrative can have access to them. Um, Chair, I don't want to take uh, too much time. I think I just want to give this uh, brief background into what the Youth for Peace Africa program that is tasked with uh, pushing the agenda of youth involvement in peace and security silencing the guns has done uh, recently. Um, there are a few more details, but I think in, in, in the interest of time, uh, I would address some of these others when the question session begins. Um, I thank you. Thank you so much. Well, uh, you have still five minutes, but uh, we will uh, use them for the question and answer. Okay, next uh, speaker is uh, Mrs. Uh, uh, Doris Pumu, are you there, my dear? Are you there? Uh, Professor ah. Lai, uh, yes. 
I'm afraid uh, Ms. Joyce will not be able to join us as she had a medical uh, emergency and I think uh, they were in the hospital. So, yes, uh, we can move on to uh, Ms. Natalie and okay, she's here with okay. us. Okay, I wish, I wish her a quick recovery. So let's move to uh, Mrs. Natalie Sonia Kondani. The floor is yours. Natalie, are you there? Natalie, are you there? Yes. Oh, good girl. Okay, the floor is yours, my dear. Take the floor. Fantastic. Thank you so much for giving me the flow. You're very kind and able moderator, also from Algiers. Uh, thank you so much, Rubia Institute of Peace Services, for having and considering having the African Youth Commission on board. Of course, I don't come to this conversation in my capacity young person, but I come to this conversation in my capacity as the chairperson of the African Youth Commission, and I will start by giving you a brief background of what the African Youth Commission is all about for those that have never heard of it. It is basically an independent pan-African youth organization that was founded so that young people from all walks of life on the continent can have a say, can have a way of participating in agendas such as the African Union Agenda 2050, the UN SDGs, because we realize on the continent there is no platform where young people can come together and actually participate in these activities. A platform that is not political, that does not consider religious interests. Basically, if you are a young person in Africa, you're part of a youth organization that is giving input to a community, you can be part of the African Youth Commission. Now, the Youth Commission is relatively a young organization. We were officially inaugurated in 2017 in Addis Ababa. And since then, we've had three successful Pan-African Youth Conferences. We are present in over 46 countries, and we have six officially rejected national consortiums. A national consortium is actually a group of youth organizations in a particular country that are part of the commission and are trying to moderate and impact the, the changes and policies and whatever programs that we have decided for that particular year. Now, the conversation, of course, is about social security. How does this relate to the African Youth Commission? Um, two years ago, we asked young people across the continent. We asked them what the four areas that if we came together as young people and we worked upon in the next 20 years would make and, and impact each and every one of you. So young people across the continent chose these four areas and these four areas are what we made into our strategic skills. The first one was employment and entrepreneurship because of course young people need livelihoods and a way to sustain themselves. The second was human rights and governance because we've had youth you know, given a space at the table to participate in politics. Um, the second world, because of course we cannot do this without good health. And the last, which is relevant to this conversation today, was peace and security. Now, as the African Youth Commission, we are privileged, like our folk speaker um, had mentioned, to witness, to have worked with young people across the continent who are not paid are not sent by government partners, who are not sent by, by government, young people who take it upon themselves to have activities, to have peace initiatives, to have protests, to create awareness. They just basically wake up one morning and they're like, oh, there's a need in the community. What can I do about it? They look at the resources they have, then they get to want to do something about it. So we have that category of young people who've taken it upon themselves to do something about in the community to do with peace and security. Also, then we have the other category of young people who've had the privilege of having resources or connections to be brought into these conversations. We have the big percentage. This is this is the group of young people that don't know anything about peace and security. They don't know how they can be involved in activities that contribute to peace and security. They don't know that even being used as phones for peace and security. Finally, I'm Ugandan, though I am based in Nairobi. Recently, those who, who follow up with peace and going 
Of course, you know Uganda was having um, elections. Now tell me, in 2021, what kind of country switches off internet for four days so that they can hold elections? How can you call for democratic elections? And here we are talking about peace and security. These are some of the things that do not help us to contribute to peace and security. Because even if we invest in young people and make sure all young people have jobs, all young people have businesses, and a president of a country wakes up and switches off internet, that is their livelihood. So for almost a week, people who rely on internet were not able to conduct business because one person wanted, did not want to appear during elections. These are some of the things we need to look into as young people. Much as we invest in young people, yes, do we have the right enabling environment for peace and security to coexist? Do we have the right policies for peace and security to coexist? Because it's really saddening that even after this happened, nobody has come out to call out, to call out the president on what they did. Does that mean any president can just wake up one morning and what they want in the name of, you know, looking at a certain type of way. So these are the things we really need to reflect upon and think about because if this is 2021, this is 1955, ladies and gentlemen, and some things are still happening, then what is the future of peace and security on the continent? What is the future of peace and security for young people? Even if they're invested in, they, there are certain things that really need to be put at the forefront, basics fundamentals, so that if these fundamentals are in place and investments are done, then the, the, the future for peace and security is, is, is much alive. Now, there are so many things that are happening on the continent. Other young people are being lured to go for protests by being bigger than money. And what do you expect? I mean, Africa has one of, I think, still the youngest population of young people in the world. But if you are to look at the percentages of how many of these young people are actually working, how many of these young people are actually entrepreneurs, how many of these young people after school have something meaningful to do, we have these percentages in the world. So now, of course, these young people are idle. These young people are desperate. We're talking about a young family, a family of 10. They've tried to look for a job, they can't. Why won't they be lured by a politician to go on a rally or go do other things that do not contribute to the peace and security that want. So of course investing is very, very critical because and I don't mind the saying the devil's workshop. How do we make sure the best dividend of young people on the continent is busy? How do we make the biggest dividend of young people on the continent is busy trying to look for innovation as opposed to means of breaking the peace and security? So as the African News Committee we are on a long journey. Of course, no journey is fast. Every journey starts with baby steps. But what enables these baby steps to be effective? A conversation such as this, the young people in these schools will now be aware of what's going on around them. They'll be more aware of how they can contribute to the conversation and be part of, part of the end of mind that we want, which is a peaceful and prosperous Africa. And it all starts with each and every young person. I know that some young people say, okay, I'm just an individual from a particular country, I'm not affiliated to any institution, but what can I do? What is my, my voice? My one voice is meaningless. And as a commission, we usually say, no voice is meaningless. Even as a sister, brother, or even young people, brothers, the moment you know what your obligation is as an individual, collectively, that obligation and that commitment really, really is like a job in an ocean. And when, of course, there's so many drops, many people say you can't take a bucket of ocean. Even the drops make the ocean. So now, to conclude, I would like to say, the journey is long and we realize the challenges. Yes, some effort towards investment in youth is being made, but we need much, much more. We need governments on board, we need more development partners on board, we need even youth themselves on board, because you find even if some youth have the opportunities, misusing them, you find even if some youth have the, the privilege of actually going out to learn about peace and security, what do they do after they learn about peace and security? Do they just sit back home? Do they wait for someone to say, okay, 
much as you have this knowledge, we're going to support you. Or do they sit down and say, okay, I have this information. Even if I don't have the resources, what can I do? The question starts from what can I do? And with a collective, what can I do from over half a billion of young people on the continent, imagine the kind of impact and change that you can all, you know, collectively do. Now, I would like to say in my concluding remarks, this conversation is just the beginning. And much as it's just the beginning, we need to take it from us to people around us. When you go back home today and you have young brothers, young sisters, or cousins, ask them, what is your view about the peace and security of the continent? Do you need peace? What is security? Get to understand their, their, their thinking, their mentality. Let's have conversations about peace and security. Let us normalize them. Maybe when people understand that to have a prosperous country, to have a prosperous continent, peace is essential. Peace is the number one ingredient. And we cannot have this in mind if people don't know what peace and security is. Let us normalize having these conversations and let us be afraid to speak out. We come from a continent where our forefathers died of independence. Some of our forefathers were taken as slaves. It took those few courageous individuals to always speak out when issues were not were not conducive. So as young people, we need to learn to speak out. We need to not be afraid. As long as we're speaking out for the truth, speaking out for justice, we need to make sure that we do not let government, we do not let individuals take us as young people and use us for their selfish interests and gain. So as I said, the journey is long. It starts with conversations such as this. One, we're having this conversation, having more and more of them. Then finally, we start the action on the ground, the action that is actually going to bring us to the Africa we want, and that is the Africa that has no wars, an Africa that has no conflict, an Africa where young people are not formed in politics, and an Africa where young people are in charge of peace and security, of first their homes, then their community, then their countries, then finally collectively as a continent. Thank you so much for your kind attention, and it's really been an honor. Thank you, Natalia. You are so passionate and a lot of dynamism and a lot of impetus in your uh, speech. Uh, okay, let's start with the question to you, Natalia, already. We have a question from uh, Soliana Tsegai. She asked you, could you please share with us some successful examples that the flagship Youth for Peace program has brought at the national level in the example of uh, maybe uh, Kenya or uh, Uganda? Natalia is yours. Uh, yes. Thank you. Thank you so much for that question. So, some examples of flagship projects. Um, uh, as the commission, we have um, we we hold a series of of peaceful talks and events so that we can bring together young people and have the discussion of peace. Um, as the commission we've also taken in the in the peace uh, United for Youth United. For Peace Caravan, I'm sure some of you have heard about it, a group of young people traveling from country to country, spreading the gospel, doing it the way um, our Messiah did it. So, like I told you, because they are stakeholders who having peace and security does not help them, they are they, they making all these efforts. But, like I also had mentioned, the more we are and the more collectively we put together our efforts, the these forces are going to significantly reduce. Because if you look at the number of activities going on in regards to peace and security, they are very little. Entrepreneurship and employment has taken the biggest sector, health and well-being has taken the biggest sector, which is okay. But also peace and security should also be at the forefront of this discussion activities. So yes, to answer your question, some activities have been going on, but they not enough. We need much, much, much more conversations and programs so that we can achieve the goal that we want. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Natalie, for this answer. Let's move to uh, Dr. Ako. We have a question from uh, Jean-Claude Ntizo Yamana. His question is, could you please tell us about any youth platform which can help youth organization to sit together and discuss peace and security issues?
Dr. Ako? Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I, mean, I think, um, uh, thank you for the question. Um, answering that question directly, there are quite a number of um, networks that are available. I think um, Natalie uh, has spoken about um, her network that, and, and you know, I think this is a valuable one. Within the Youth for Peace uh, Africa program, we also have um, six uh, communication channels all on uh, WhatsApp for now, and uh, five of them are representative of uh, each of the five regions uh, on the continent, and then we have a continental uh, platform. Uh, we also have a platform uh, that has uh, the AU and the regional institutions, as well as the five IAPs, and then, you know, discussions from there, the IAPs then take to their uh, constituents through the regional uh, uh, chat uh, rooms. So from the AU, as long as you're a young person and you're working in uh, the peace and security uh, arena, you are you are able to join uh, each of the, any of the groups that is, is in your region. Um, and, and they are, you know, really, really vibrant discussions that uh, go on. Uh, while Natalie was uh, talking, I was uh, smiling because uh, the East Africa uh, uh, forum was was highly dynamic in the past uh, two weeks with uh, issues related to you know the elections, uh, the, the the peace and security conditions, uh, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, the 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 those those uh, chat rooms also serve a good purpose. Networking. Uh, there's always uh, information on available. Um, uh, opportunities, you know, in terms of training, funding, collaboration for youth networks. So, um, yep, I, I would say that uh, there are within the Youth for Peace Africa program uh, these uh, opportunities, but uh, there are also, you know, others like Natalie's as well as um, some regional uh, clusters that, you know, I'm aware of. I think the, the, the key thing is for uh, youth themselves to sort of determine what they're interested in or what they have experience in, and then um, determine uh, what sort of uh, these forums would be most appropriate uh, for, for, for them. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Let me uh, again ask you the, say, the question from Rubia. Uh, it's directed to you. What practical and operable recommendation can we forward to tackle the existing challenge? That's the question. I mean, in practical term, what are the recommendations that we can follow or forward to tackle the existing challenge about youth uh, and the silencing the guns issue? Uh, I mean, before I, before I answer that, I think your attention is being called by Ruby Yat, that there's a hand up, perhaps. Yes. Yes, uh, Ab Ababa is raising his hand. Uh, I wanted to uh, draw your attention to him as well. He's been raising his hand since uh, we started. Sorry, I haven't seen that yet. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Okay. Sorry, I was also raising for a long time, but uh, nobody was considering that. So. Sorry, sorry, I'm so sorry about that. Okay, go ahead, uh, go ahead, Millie. Okay, shall I proceed? I'm over there. Thank okay, you. Go ahead. Yes. Okay, Thank go you. Ahead. Yeah. Uh, let me proceed first. Uh, uh, go ahead. It, it's a nice presentation. This is my second presentation from African Union. Uh, in 2018, I also attended this discussion, uh, which was presented at IPSS uh, in uh, by the ambassador from South Africa and also from uh, African Peace and Peace and Security Commission, uh, the then uh, ambassador. And this issue is really a rolling issue from time to time. And it's also a shocking issue. And my name is Madlasa. I'm a, one of the MAPSA graduates, but working for an international organization in many conflict affected countries. And I've been in Africa, in the northern east, in northeastern parts of Nigeria, with the Boko Haram conflict, and also with Somali conflict and uh, with Al Shabaab as well as also northeastern Kenya with the refugee community where Asha was highly infested and causing a lot of problems and challenges. And now currently I'm working in South Sudan. And uh, 
Well, you know, the, the, the major challenge which I'm observing now uh, from the presenter, from the two presenters uh, ahead of me, uh, uh, really we are talking at the policy level. The policy level is a different issue, but the grass level is a different issue. And Africa is a very rich continent, and we have a lot of resources which can really support youth involvement in any kind of development, and which other countries, particularly the Western countries, do not have. The mineral resources and everything, uh, everything is available. But the major challenges, the policy is not translated into, the policy we are talking about, those people who are at policy level, has not translated what they have set at the policy level into action. They have not translated, this is a major issue now. We in the field, practitioners working for youth, have seen a lot of challenges. We are working on child protection, we are working on education emergencies, we are working on uh, youth development, through different approaches, uh, at least use not to get involved into armed conflict. And these are the major concerns on the one hand, which we have not paid attention to. I know that 20 to, to, to the UN resolution 2250 is there, 2019 is, uh, is also there. But we are talking about you know the upper level of the issue, which has not really which has nothing to do with the youth unless it is translated into action. Uh, one is this issue, and I have heard also Natalia what she was talking about. I have heard Dr. Rukis what she was saying about, but are we really ready to get down into the youth, the community? Have we shared our policies? Have we shared our strategies? Have we shared our vision, including also the youth vision for development? I do remember most of the, and we have raised the issue of, for instance, violent extremism by uh, Dr. By Dr. Ruke. We have raised about migration. Who are the, who, these are, who are the actors for this now? What are the root causes of this problem? We are not discussing the root cause of this problem. The root cause problem is obviously no, but we should not just cover it with, with honey and talk about you know, the other issues which is very uh, nicely presented. But we need to dig out the root cause of the problem of youth in Africa. Do we have democracy in Africa? Are we really, do we have good governance? Are youth able to say something about? Do youth have their own, you know, their own opportunity to grow, to develop, even educationally? The simplest way, education is the basic right for for you, for children and youth. So this is what we need to pay attention to first, and we need to work with the with the government. Even African Union need to really closely work with the government. Now, Natalia was reading about the recent election. We have the young youth who is 38 years old, competing for a presidency, and still you know. No, that opportunity was missed again. And, uh, you know, we, we, we should pay attention to all this. I uh, worked in, as I mentioned to you, in Libya, in conflict-affected countries, in Northeast, Niger, in, uh, in Northeast Nigeria, in Somalia for four years, and in also in no Northeast Kenya with, in 2011-2012 during the crisis. This has taught me a lot of lessons. Recently, the Rohingya crisis again. And we have seen the youth involvement is not paid attention to. For one thing, what should we change? What are the triggering factors for children to get involved in violent conflict in Northeast Nigeria? Ignorance, no education. And the way things are brought to that area is different scenario. Because even within the government, within the government there are people who are instigating such issues to aggravate within Africa because they have some opportunities also, it's a means of survival for others. So it's not for the public. The public is suffering at the expense of others. And we have children crossing, walking through the long desert of Sahara Desert, dying in the desert, at the same time crossing the, the rivers, dying again. And we, this is the suffering we have now. 
this suffering, how do we solve it? How do we really tackle this problem then? How do we bring this then? It's not only IPSS, if they want to bring things into concrete and into evidence-based and tangible uh, reasons, I think we need to work with the government, with the government at uh, African and Union level. And these are the crucial components. And those of you who are at high level post, go down to the country level and also to the local community level and see where conflicts are aggravating and causing, you know, uh, impact on the community in general because of lack of uh, resources and the poverty, youths are getting involved into uh, such kind of environment and without any, you know, uh, without any interest, but it's a poverty issue and the lack of democracy and good governance. We need to pay attention to that. First, let's tackle the root cause. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emily. Uh, really, you touched to the to the real issue, and uh, thank you for being so so uh, realistic. Because uh, issues of good governance, rule of law, democracy, justice, and uh, reconciliation are really issues that should be tackled by uh, government and uh, and uh, of course all the, uh, in the other bodies from the civil society. Let's have, before we moving to Abibi, let's have a, a comment from Dr. Eko regarding what just Mel said. Dr. Eko, what is your comments? Thank you very much, Lae. I mean, I, I find uh, his comments really um, interesting. Um, and these, there's really um, nothing, um, shall I say, completely new in what he has said. These are things that uh, we all know. They are, they are root causes of uh, conflicts. And this is exactly what uh, the, the whole notion of silencing the guns uh, is meant to, to tackle, not just active conflicts, like I said earlier, but also the root causes, uh, including, uh, you know, democracy, good governance, uh, like he mentioned. Um, however, I would like to implore us to always remember something. There are institutions and there are limitations as to their um, modus, you know, operandi, with the things that they're able to do. Uh, everyone has their responsibilities. Now, uh, for policy makers, the situations that they are confronted with and think of uh, developing policies that are responsive uh, to those uh, challenges. Once those policies are in place, then it's for those who implement policies. And by this, you refer to the government, you refer to uh, civil society, which includes youth organizations, as a matter of fact, uh, to then implement these policies or actually, and or hold their, respons their governments responsible or accountable for the implementation of these policies. Um, I think it'd be unfair to, to to, to say that policy making doesn't have a, a, a frontline role or position in dealing with these challenges. But what we also have to begin to think more critically about is once policies are there, who are the primary duty bearers and how can they be held accountable for effecting what those policies are meant to achieve? Uh, when I was speaking about um, the, 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 the policies being developed at the AU level, for instance, um, I made mention of the fact that we're trying to ensure that these policies are not huge, bulky documents that sit on a shelf and no one is, you know, looking to read, I don't know, 300, uh, 100 pages. So what we've done is to try to simplify, put in different formats, put it in as many languages as we possibly can, and then begin to advocate and ensure that, you know, both the, the, the documents themselves and the import of the policies therein are communicated uh, effectively. Uh, what we do at the, at the African Union, for instance, is to, as a first step, uh, uh, interact with regional, and uh, regional institutions, the RECs and the RMs, and sensitize them on what these documents are about what they mean, and fortunately for us, we develop them together with them. Uh, the next step is to then begin to engage member states. And with these is to say, there's a need to have national action plans on youth, peace and security in particular, you know, 
that would supplement whatever policies or, and laws that they have for youth development generally uh, per, per member state. But then, once that is done and we're able to do that, I think as policymakers, you have done your bit. What then is left is for civil society, and this is a key role of civil society, to hold governments accountable for things that they are duty bound to provide to their citizens. And this is the role for them. And civil society is also, like I said, inclusive of youth networks and organizations for whose primary benefits these policies have been created. So yes, I agree there are the challenges of, uh, uh, like, like, like he mentioned, you know, the lack of education, uh, the migration and all of that. But we cannot focus on challenges because these policies are being developed to tackle those challenges. And I think if we begin to, to find avenues of working together, which is what the Continental Framework is trying to do, of ensuring that there's a holistic method of engaging um, youth peace and security issues on the continent, then perhaps we can find ways of doing things differently and more effectively. And I think this is where we have to recognize that we all have a part to play and it doesn't all go well if we, if, we, if we think the blame lies somewhere. I think the issue is how to move this agenda forward. And uh, that's what I think uh, this seminar amongst others is, is out uh, to, to, to achieve Lahid. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, let's move to Abibi. Is a Halim. The floor is yours. Abibi, can you hear me? Yes, indeed. Okay, go ahead with your question okay, thank or whatever your comments. Okay, thank you, Chairperson, and thank you, presenters. Uh, actually, uh, I do have one uh, question, which goes to Dr. Aku regarding to silencing of again. I recognize that. Uh, participating girls and children in silencing of and have its own imminent contribution for creating peace in Africa in the region or in the continent at large, definitely. But how we can implement that is a very challenging question. Uh, uh, since we know the governments or the government stylus or uh, the government mechanisms held by African uh, leaders. Uh, but I am uh, Coming to the APSA, the African Peace and Security Architecture, which is planned by the African Peace and Security Council to achieve silencing of guns in 2020, yet the year before, which is part of a uh, 50 years plan of African Union, which is achieved in uh, 2063. Indeed, I believe that uh, it's not yet achieved or it's failed to achieve for silencing of the guns and seems challenging to achieve since we are observing simmering actual and potential treaties across the continent, since we are in the continent. So there are many, many intricate uh, vicissitudes which are uh, hindering or challenging uh, to achieve sil silencing of guns in the continent. So my question is, basically, there is upset challenge in relation to silencing of the gun. But there is also, uh, I hear that the silencing of guns is postponed for 2030, if I am not mistaken. Dr. Raku, you may just give me briefing that one. So what's the reason behind for postponing of silencing of the guns? Do you think that it will be achieved in 2060s in relation with ZAPSA uh, challenge? Thank you very much. Thank you, Abebe. Uh, Dr. Ako? Uh, thank you. Thank you for that uh, uh, question. And I think your, your observations are, are quite uh, interesting in, in terms of, you know, looking at the uh, issue of uh, youth and their involvement in um, uh, silencing the guns. Um, I mean, if I, if I should answer your question directly, uh, why postpone? Um, I think what, what, what is important is to look at it not as a postponement of the attainment, because 
um, what what 2020 was for was the year with when the progress, uh, like a progress report, you know, would be made to see how, you know, the process had gone and then uh, take it forward from there. Now, if you ask me, is silencing the guns um, uh, uh, something that is finite with an end point? I would say no. If we go back to what I've said and the, 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 the documents on silencing the guns, it's not about simply ending active conflict, but also addressing root causes of conflict, which means it's a continuum which means as long as there are these issues of good governance as a challenge, as long as there are issues of um, uh, uh, human rights abuses as a challenge, then you know the issue of silencing the guns, so to speak, is still one that needs to be uh, engaged with. So do I think it, 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 it has failed you know, in terms of uh, meeting the objectives of APSA? No. As a matter of fact, there has been, in my view, um, tremendous uh, gains based on uh, silencing the guns last year when it was the AU theme of the year. Because throughout the year, there was focus, at least from uh, the Office of the Youth Envoy, from the Youth Division of the HRST uh, in the AU, as well as uh, the Youth for Peace Africa program within the PSD, dedicated all the resources and programming towards youth and SDG. And by this, what we were able to achieve was to bring uh, young, active young peace builders on the continent to sensitize them not only on the roles of the AU in peace building, but also their own roles and contributions to peace building from the community level up to you know the national, regional, and continental level, and I think this is very key because without understanding, Natalie uh, touched on this. Some people, some young people, don't even realize that in their own little way they are contributing to silencing the guns. And permit me to give a very quick example. Uh, we, 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 in one of the regional consultations we had, there was a, a young cashew. Uh, 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 plantation farmer, young young man. And we he said to us he saw no reason why he was invited to a peace building uh, event. And we said to him, do you realize the connection between economic empowerment and peace? He had no clue. And this is a young person who was employing young people. And when we drew the connection, how this endeavor connected with peace and security, for instance, then he said, you know what, guys, now that I know, I am going to be, in fact, more um, um, dedicated to this endeavor. And I just give that as a basic example. I can give you numerous examples in the last three years. So what am I saying here? I am saying that um, it's a process. We've had certain uh, uh, achievements. We need to build on them. And the, 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 the fact that uh, the, the, the silence in the guns has been quote unquote postponed till 2030 is not suggesting that in 2030 that all guns will be silent. What it means is at 2020, there will be a sit down, there will be another review of what has been achieved, what the challenges remain, and uh, the, the, the way forward therefrom. So, silencing the guns, in my view, is not um, um, a finite. Uh, 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 thing, but it's 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 a process, and we all have a, a part to play in it, uh, as you know, young people and those pushing the agenda of youth peace and security. Thank you. Thank you. Look, it's, it's really a big issue silencing the guns. Uh, let's have uh, there is a comment, uh, a question and comment from Ben Kap Kapatuka, and his question he is: How do we make sure that issues coming from youth forums? Uh, given practical solution, especially uh, to those with, say, government governance within individual countries of, of our forum. And his comments, obviously, we know that the news and media outlets, that there is a little practical approach aimed at supporting younger people resolve their concern with country. Yes, it's uh, to you again. Uh, let's, let's hear from uh, Natalie. Where is Natalie? Natalie? 
Have you there? Natalie? Natalie, Sonia? Uh, no, I think Nat Nat Natalie, I see, has left a message in the chat chat box. I think. Uh, I, I, haven't, I haven't seen it yet. Okay, okay. Take the floor again, uh, Dr. Aku. Uh, uh, yes, she, she left, yes. Okay, Th okay, the floor is yours again, uh, Dr. Aku. Okay, thank you. I mean, this, this, thank you, Dan, for your, for your question. Um, um, and how, how do we ensure that issues coming from youth forums are giving practical solutions? Uh, at the beginning of my speech, I mean, of my, of my presentation, I, I told you in uh, November 2018, when the Youth for Peace Africa program was uh, being inaugurated, uh, it was with the AU, uh, Rex and RMs, uh, and, and um, uh, youth networks uh, representing uh, each of the five regions of, of the continent and the diaspora. And the Youth for Peace Africa program took its priorities from the outcomes of that inaugural uh, meeting. In other words, this wasn't the case of the AU setting up uh, a, a program and tasking it with what to do. In other words, the program was set up not without a predetermined uh, uh, set of obje uh, objectives. Yes, it had the broad aim of mainstreaming youth into the peace and security uh, arena, but what those priorities were, were determined, you know, uh, primarily by uh, young uh, peace builders uh, at, 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 at the time. And like I said, their priorities included, you know, sort of countering the negative uh, uh, projection of, of young African uh, uh, women and men. And what did we do? We countered, we, we come out with a study, you know, that speaks about the roles and contributions of uh, youth to peace and security in Africa. This study was carried out for, I think, a year and a half, and we had consultations in all five regions of, of, of Africa with inputs coming in from young people working at uh, the community level, the grassroots. Um, it also brought in uh, uh, experts from from the academia, CSOs, research institutes. So this is a, 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 a proper uh, a study, you know, that that, that came out. Uh, the second thing was on, uh, let me speak on this because I think this might perhaps ring uh, more of a bell. The other thing that came out from that was the need to build capacities of young people. And what did we do? You know, we we sat down over the period of uh, the, the time and sought to find out what the key uh, needs of young people working in peace building uh, were. One of them was project management, you know, the whole cycle, how to write the project, how to seek funding. Uh, the other was, you know, that uh, capacity building on specific uh, topics such as, you know, uh, human rights and so on and so forth. What did we do here? Again, we, 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 we sought uh, partners from those who were more experienced than us in the case of human rights. We partnered with the United Nations Office of the High Commissioner on Human Rights uh, and, and have delivered a series of um, capacity building. We've done capacity building on uh, project management, you know. So we've, what we're trying to do here is, in a sense, not to go into the, 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 the communities and pretend we can solve those problems, but we are capacitating young people who themselves are doing extremely um, fantastic jobs in uh, meeting those issues. So the role that we have in providing practical solutions have been to meet young peace builders at, at the point of need which they identified to us. And, you know, like I said, there are several examples uh, that I can I can go into. However, um, I think at this point, it's also very important to, to touch on something. Um, it's often the case that uh, support for young people is often determined or seen through the lens of, you know, sort of financial contributions or financial investments. Uh, but I beg to differ. I think there is more value in capacitating 
the person, the institution, who are then able themselves to, you know, with that capacity, determine how to uh, effectively engage in whatever activities are deemed as their priorities. Thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, Natalie has apologized because she has another meeting, but she left uh, an optimist, a positive note that uh, let's continue the fight to have a full, peaceful, a fully peaceful and secure Africa together. I want to ask uh, Mili, who is uh, Mili, who is in the field. Uh, can you hear me, Mili? Hello, is Mili around? Yes, I can hear you. Sure. Oh, good. Yeah, my friend, you are men uh, in the in the field, and I want to ask you first of all, what is your command of what you just heard from uh, Rooks, as well as what are the main challenges you are facing in your work every day, in your work every day in in your place. Well, uh, you know, uh, I I worked also with uh, you know the Ashwa uh, prisoners in uh, Somalia for peace building and other things, and the pirates where, when they were in the in prison. You know, when you talk to them, then you know they got involved because of lack of opportunities. Okay, these children are moving to join armed group at the age of 13, 14, child soldier is one of the biggest challenge we are having as a humanitarian worker. And we need to address the needs of these people. That's what I'm saying as an African. And we have the community, a strong community in the country, I mean, in the continent. The community is very strong and they are able also to uh, really uh, deal with their children. But the issue is now, those there are opportunities which these children are lacking. As I mentioned to you, one is education and education is the key for this aspect and we need to address also you know for the youth and particularly you know youth need to be captured under the auspices of what we call the technical vocational approaches where we had with unicef and the ilo and UNDP jointly together made a social rehabilitation and also coupled with economic rehabilitation for this use so we need to devise a strategy to address the challenges that we are facing now this is what I'm talking about as, 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 as a major problem at the grassroots level. But my concern, which I raised, which is common to all, as Dr. Rukia said, they know it, but still we are all trying to solve the problem. And the major one is we need to have good governance. That's a key issue for us. Rule of law needs to be respected. And why children moving from, 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 from different countries to Europe or to South Africa or to Australia and at the end of the day we feel sadly because they end up in the, in the ocean and we have seen this practically but no action has been taken really to make thanks to Paul Kagame President Paul Kagame who really brought back some of the migrants from Libya and settled in his own country this is one of the solutions stepping stone for us and we need to have a positive thinkers and we need to have many positive thinkers in the continent to really change the attitude and the behavior of the children and the youth the future the the future children the, the current children are the future you know governor govern, governance we can say so I, I i think we need to as we mentioned also we have a, a lot of local civil society organizations and national NGOs international NGOs working in this area. And we need to tackle the key challenges that these youths are facing. We know that we have everything at hand, well written, but we need to stipulate it into an action. That's what I'm saying. So uh, as we said, you know, this problem is challenging. For instance, now in South Sudan, we have, we have child soldiers and we want to bring them back to normalcy and just join the school of, by opening you know, temporary learning spaces or technical vocational use education park uh, park approach and we are providing them this kind of lessons but how do we strengthen them really uh, these issues the government should pay attention to my experience i have also written my dissertation on it the on the, the uh, in northeast nigeria the case of boko haram and these children in the northeast Nigeria, even they don't know their parents. 
because the parents are giving these children to the to almajris the almajris are the one who are using them as begging children later on they really change their attitude to different atmosphere this is a simple example i can give in the continent how do we address this issue the government in each country should pay attention to and give necessary opportunities to youth that's what i'm saying uh, dr uh, professor lead thank you thank you uh, yes uh, well i i want to go back to uh, rooks of course uh, about uh, the continental approach of uh, this issue but uh, do, is there any mechanism to uh, oversee and uh, to uh, monitor the, on the practice on the ground uh, what uh, it is dec decided at the continental uh, level true that's it uh, th thank you for thank you for that question. And this is this is where um, you know the point I was trying to make in terms of you know uh, policy making uh, and and when when you know that's often countered with oh we have so many policies already we don't need new policies. Uh, yes, some sometimes we need new policies. And what these new policies may be bringing in is that ability you know uh, to 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 monitor or report which may have been uh, lacking in a previous policy. Now, in terms of youth peace and security, uh, we don't have, um, we haven't had uh, until now a, a holistic uh, a framework that dealt with the matter. Of course, we had uh, 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 the African <coughs> chapter which had uh, provisions. Um, but with this policy uh, uh, document, what, what it seeks to do is to, you know, provide uh, uh, youth with uh, priorities across five areas, you know, participation, prevention, protection, partnerships and coordination, disengagement and integration. And these are all in line with, you know, um, um, articles 11 and 17 of the Africa Youth Charter and uh, uh, the UNSCR 2250. Now, but the main question is, how do we sort of measure or how do we ensure that these objectives are met now for the for the um for the continental framework on youth peace and security there are three or four main things that are, are, are like measuring uh, indices the first is the annual report to the psc Remember, I, I mentioned that um, in 2018, we had, uh, we, we, we lobbied and had the first uh, session on youth peace and security. Now, at that session, the PSC decided that it would have an annual open session on the theme youth peace and security. And since then, we've had three of such, one in 2018, one in 2019, and one in 2020. And it's always in November, the month to uh, commemorate uh, youth in Africa. Now, the intent is that at these sessions, the progress made, as well as the challenges faced and envisaged in implementing these policies at the national level, which is the, which is, you know, where the action is, would be brought back uh, to the PSC. What will then happen at that instance would be the PSC would deliberate and see what actions or decisions it can take to again counter whatever those uh, challenges are at, at that time. In addition to the annual report to the PSC, there will also be the midterm review of the implementation framework. Like I said, the, 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 the uh, continental framework has a 10-year implementation plan. So media, the fifth year, which would uh, be in 20. Uh, 24, there will be a review of how this policy has been implemented. And when I say a review, this is not a review that will be done by me or some folks sitting in the office, but it will be done with regional institutions, with uh, uh, national, uh, member states and uh, youth networks. And for us, these sort of platforms provide a very good avenue where the, the, the youth networks can begin to understand the workings of government at the member state level and the regional organizations, and also begin to see how they can leverage on, on, on this uh, uh, knowledge 
and in fact uh, uh, feel better off it. Then finally, uh, there's the progress report at the end of the 10-year plan. Now, what that means is at the end of the of the 10th year, the, the review will be again done to determine the extent to which uh, all stakeholders, so um, the AU, regional organizations, um, development partners, member states, youth networks themselves, and other CSOs have played their role, you know, to develop YPS. And then a new course will be charted uh, if necessary at, 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 at that time. So for me, this, these are the steps within the framework that enable us have um, um, a sort of review of how well uh, it has worked, uh, Lahid. Thank you. Yeah, let me let me make some comments and uh, uh, leave it open to anyone of our guests and the participant to uh, intervene. Uh, my question is, or my comments, uh, we as uh, parents, uh, what have we done to our uh, children uh, and youth to grow up in a peaceful and uh, uh, in adequate environment? And also another another reality, uh, and we have to to face it. I think most African countries are not producing arms, uh, except maybe South Africa and to some extent Egypt. But still, we have about 40 million uh, small arms are within the, the civil society, uh, I mean the civil population. Don't we have to blame ourselves for being uh, passive and accepting from uh, the world uh, arm producer to pour uh, their arms in, uh, in Africa? Uh, the question is to all of you, uh, dear, dear participant, if you want to say something or any comments. I would don't like to put all pressure on uh, Dr. Aku. Yes? Yes, Mili, take the floor, Mili. Yes? Yes. Uh, thank you, Professor Leet. Uh, as compared to the United States in terms of guns, <laughs> Africa is a peanut. 40 million is a peanut. We have 123 million guns in the United States. Okay? Yes. That's not yes. an issue. That's not an issue. The issue is still, you know, these guns that those are imported from uh, abroad and really causing a problem within the continent is the biggest challenge. It's a matter of attitude and behavior that we need to deal with. We need to change, you know, the, our children and we need to really build them up in ethical approach so that these children can really serve their content in a proper manner. Now, uh, the most important thing is one, as I mentioned to you, the ethnic situation in Africa is one challenge that we are looking into, which we need to solve it, okay? And this dynamism needs to be solved because we have a lot of resources. The availability of resources, again, are the one which is causing also conflict within our community. And how do we manage? It's a win-win situation that we need to make among our community for the nation's development, for the continent's development. And this is an issue now. For me, this is a simple issue is now, it's not the presence of the gun here, but as I mentioned to you, as compared to that, it's a peanut still. But let's address it in a very systematic approach in dealing with human development. Thank you. My pleasure. Okay, can we hear from the other guests, please, from the other participant? Yes, any comments before we give it uh, the floor again to uh, Rooks? Yes, who want to uh, intervene? Who want to, to make a comments? Yes. We have uh, around 20 participants and we appreciate to hear from you. Okay, please be interactive and active, responsive. Yes. Okay. Okay, Google. Hello. Yes, Gordon is the floor is yours, Gordon. Take the floor, Gordon. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Layet. Yeah. Um, I think it's a very important, a very key topical issue that we are discussing today on women, on youth, children, and um, and dance. Um, I, I I've kind of like I've, I've just been reflecting and thinking on what Dr. Apple has said in relation to silencing the guns ambition. So silencing the guns by 2020. For me, I think it, that's how ambitious Africa should be. And for me, the 10 year 
the first 10 year plan coming to silencing the guns by 2020 for me was ambitious um, enough. And, and for me, that's, that's really encouraging that we can be as ambitious as that. I think I look at it in two ways. One part is to keep that ambition that guns have to be silent in Africa. And they think they have to be silent in Africa. Um, and, and one part is also to say that I think when the 10 year, first 10 year implementation plan was being developed, people were as, were as ambitious as that by 2020, guys, guns should be silent. Now we come to 2020, maybe we have done 30 to 40% of the progress, which is really fine in the sense that now the governments have met again in December and then say, and it kind of like extended, it's, it's not necessarily postponing it to, to, to ten, another 10 years. It's kind of like looking at the issues that are still pending and the issues that still needs to be done in order to silence the guns. But also, I mean, just accepting that 2020 was maybe too ambitious <laughs> and we have not been able to meet our targets. So then saying that this we cannot let go because peace is very, very essential uh, for Africa's development and for us to be able to move on because the guns can destroy the things that we would have taken so, so many years to build. And so the possibility that um, this could be extended for me was, was really a positive thing. But also I wanted to kind of like mention in terms of what was said on policy and implementation. And one of the things that maybe I could have realized for 2020 silence in the guns is that you have a policy, but then the resources and the structures for implementing the policies came in very, very late. So we have the silence in the gun secretariat, maybe only coming into force in three years before 2020. So the resources for the policy discourse and the things that we put on, I mean, in terms of, I think, policy making and finding resources to be able to implement the policy, sometimes there's really that gap. And this I think we have seen in the, in, in, in the vision for silence in the dance by 2020, and how then maybe three years before, then work then started to accelerate, and as a result, yes it's still pending maybe guns are not going to be silenced com completely but there were specific issues that they thought could have been done by 2020 but the resources were not um were not available i also wanted to i mean there was something that was said by the, the young presenter from uh, who is based in kenya from uganda which i really felt i mean it, it, it put questions in my mark because she was talking about the internet shutdown and she felt that that was not very good. And, and I, I don't think it's, it's only in that context. We have been in context in many other countries where we have seen internet shutdown being kind of like the quickest and easiest solutions uh, to disable or to discapacitate young people to be able to mobilize. And I don't really think that um, there has been enough reflection on whether that should happen or should not happen. And I think from what she said, she felt that it's, it's really something that we should, or Africa should actually confront. And I really, I think it's important to kind of like have a discourse around that as well, because we see it often happening in many other countries. <laughs> I mean, um, when, when things are happening or uh, when, when people are voicing out uh, that um, maybe internet is, is, is shut. Those were my, um, my reflections. Thank you. Thank you, Gordon. Okay, I'll give the floor to Collins. The, Collins, Shava, the floor is yours. Collins. Uh, th thank you, Dr. Laid. Um, I want to thank you for this opportunity and uh, for leading such an interesting discussion. I might have uh, come in a bit late, but I just wanted to raise um, an issue that uh, going forward, as we see that uh, there the, the is a, a renewed, a kind of renewed uh, feeling that we are going to be having uh, the agenda of silence in the dance for the next 10 years as well. But uh, we, and I appreciate some of the um, progress that has been done on that regard in, in different parts of the continent and some of the structures that have been set in place. But I just wanted to, to say that uh, there is um, uh, a, a trend of, uh, of, uh, of uh, the manifestation of how guns are being used now in, in Africa. 
uh, in terms of uh, uh, some 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 regimes. Uh, even this lockdown, we have seen that uh, there's been an excessive use of, of, of force on, on, on citizens, and sometimes uh, people are killed by guns. But so we need to to ensure that uh, we we going going forward. Uh, uh, we, we don't carry that grievance where pe people are afraid of their security forces in their countries because they can be shot at any time and, and no one is owed to account for that. So I think we also need to include that discourse in, in, in our future discussions on, on, on silencing the guns. It's not only war, but something which happens in country and and, 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 and there's a detriment effect on, on, on citizens. And I've also seen that there's a, an infiltration of small arms and uh, in, in, in many of our communities. And I've seen it even here in Zimbabwe that uh, the, the number of small arms that people have and which are unregistered is, is quite alarming to, to, to see a, a gun uh, violence happening in, in, in different parts where there are some mineral resources. I think it's also a discourse we need to we need to to to, to also uh, put into into play because th there is that trend where young people have been involved uh, in with, with using those uh, small arms which are unregistered and it also uh, causing a lot of uh, conflict. And also, lastly, I wanted to, to talk about how we should also going forward. We should also push for more regional integration or more regional interventions. I, I want to, to say a specific example of what is happening. Happening in in Mozambique, it's a situation which is uh, which is uh, troubling to the Sadiq area, and uh, I'm sure how uh, policies from the AU can support uh, uh, regional structures so that they can uh, intervene as, as a block to ensure that they can curb insurgency before it it gets worse. But as it seems as it is, uh, the, the intervention is, is quite lacking, and and it will uh, provide some problems for us. So I just wanted to to to, to also throw those those uh, suggestions into the into the table. Thank you. Thank you, Colin. Yes, yes. Any other comments before uh, giving the floor again to Dr. Aku? Just uh, I want to make some uh, some comments myself. Uh, yes, when we uh, talk about extending to 2030, uh, you, I mean, all of us have to admit the complexity of the situation in Africa. As I said earlier in my introduction, between 1990 and 2015, there, there were over uh, 603 armed conflict in the whole continent. Can you imagine? And 75% uh, of those conflicts are from uh, non-state actors. In other words, this, uh, 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 not uh, the government is not uh, is not fully and directly involved but here again uh, we uh, africa is crying of democracy we lack democracy we lack uh, uh, public participation uh, uh, civil uh, society engagement and so forth and uh, uh, of course this is not uh, new we inherit uh, colonial past and uh, the, the situation is so complex in many countries uh, and uh, to reach uh, a peaceful and uh, uh, free free uh, hand or free uh, zone of uh, arms in Africa. It takes a long journey. Uh, you have we have to bear in mind uh, the agenda to 2063. So I think the the good things uh, need some time and even maybe a little bit longer compared to the other. But still, we have to build up a new approach of self confidence, of peace building, of resilience, of of course optimism. We have to move our mindset from pessimism to uh, Afro-optimism. Uh, Do you agree with me, Dr. Aku? I mean, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I think um, there's no doubt that um, there's, there's um, optimism needed. And personally, I, I, I've said this severally, and I'll repeat it. That from my engagement, from my make the you know going around the continent and meeting uh, young peace builders, I have absolutely no doubt that we have a crop of young Africans that are um, resilient, that are bent on um, uh, making their contributions towards silencing the guns by by combating uh, issues of uh, poverty issues of education, issues of participation, issues of building uh, uh, democratic, the democratic uh, responsibility within citizens, you know, amongst other things. I mean, let's, let's, and let, let's face it, um, and you mentioned it, you know, this uh, notion of silencing the guns 
is not um, a simple one. It's, it's complex. You know, again, I reiterate, it's not simply about ending active wars, but also addressing root causes of conflict. And I, and I, and I think I really love what um, uh, Colin said, talking about, I think it was Colin who spoke uh, before you, uh, when he was talking about uh, the, the issue of uh, governments uh, increasingly um, you know, uh, taking taking arms against their citizens that you know that they are born to protect, um, and this is this is a big issue. I mean, we saw it in um, Nigeria, for instance. You know, where peaceful protesters were were uh, uh, faced with uh, gun wielding uh, security operatives. But you know, there is also that need to think beyond. Um, uh, what the immediate cause was to 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 examine the root causes, and this is where you would, you know, begin to understand the complexities of uh, silence in the guns. Because in Nigeria, yes, the issue was about uh, a young uh, man being harassed by security operatives. That is what instigated it. But it was also a culmination of uh, um, um, lack of accountability. Uh, uh, extrajudicial uh, issues concerning security operatives that young people felt were also endemic in the bureaucracy of governance, you know. So this, in a sense, is what we also refer to as, you know, root causes of conflicts within the context of silence in the guns. So if you, if you, if you, if you look at it this way, then you also appreciate that, you know, when you take this occurrence and multiply it by 55, uh, uh, member states that we do have a lot of work on our hands as a continent, uh, in, uh, you know, striving to uh, quote unquote silence the guns. But we all, like I said previously, have our roles to play. Uh, there are those whose uh, job it is to be, uh, you know, in the communities. And in the communities, what do you do? You know, it's sensitization quelling uh, disputes before they become violent because disputes are a natural uh, part of societal progress. Um, it's about uh, providing economic opportunities. And, you know, from that really small level, then um, you, you're making change, you know. And for those who operate on a larger scale, such, such as, you know, the bigger NGOs or international NGOs, as well as you know, uh, regional institutions such as the Vex RMs and then continental ones as the AU. You know, these these are organisations that also have their role either in building policy or in 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 programmatic work. You know, so yes, I share your optimism, and I think that um, uh, we do have um, a really vibrant, resilient, uh, young. Uh, peace builders on the continent with which we formed uh, tremendous and yielding partnerships. And I have no doubt that, you know, um, we, 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 we have um, cause to be optimistic uh, looking forward uh, in terms of the agenda on uh, youth peace and security in Africa. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Let's hear from a female voice. We hear it already from uh, Rubia, but uh, what about uh, Hadiza, Soliana, and Riwina? Is there any comment from you, ladies? Hello? Riwina, Hadiza, Soliana. Okay, uh, my question, uh, well, my remark, I want to give floor again to Collins, and uh, and my, uh, I want to hear from you, uh, with regard, what what will be your practical and operable recommendation to solve this issue, Collins? Uh, th thank you, Doctor. Um, I I want to also thank uh, Ako for 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 such a, um, um, a an, an elaborate response to to, to our um, contributions. But what I would want to say is that probably one of the uh, most things that we must uh, uh, focus on is to ensure that young people in our countries or in our in our spaces of work are uh, involved at the center of, of peace processes. It is also uh, a matter of trying to understand uh, where young people are coming from because uh, uh, it's, it's where the, the root 
causes are. There are so many frustrations in which young in which young people are in, and we can't be able to solve them. Uh, as to say today, we can solve them, but it's a process of how do we include those uh, frustrations and to ensure that our countries be able to to respond to the needs of young people. Secondly, it's also an issue of. Um, of trying to, to, to enhance our security in, 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 in many places in Africa because the smuggling of small arms or the proliferation of small arms in, in many of our countries, probably from my example in Zimbabwe, is, is still uh, very low, but it's, it's, it's quite alarming from someone who is, who is observant because the, the, the way the, the arms are being smuggled in there, it, it questions the security of our countries. And, that is also an important thing that we need to call for uh, in enhanced security and and enhanced security checks within our borders to ensure that we 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 don't have the proliferation of, of false more arms. They have been doing it for so many years. They have been able to curb the proliferation of arms into the country. But now I'm I'm a bit doubtful of of what is happening. And also, lastly, it's also a, ma a matter of calling out the governments that are, are using excessive force on their citizens. If a government has an obligation to 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 protect these people. Why would you shoot them? You know, it's it's a matter of also uh, ensuring that in our own spaces of work, uh, we be it in our governments and be it in our diplomatic cooperations, ensure that we we, we keep the checks and balances. Maybe as a, from from myself speaking from a civil society's perspective, it's more so uh, more of keeping uh, the, our governments at check to ensure that they don't use excessive force on their on their people and they also don't shoot their their citizens it's, it's also a, a matter of, of keeping that uh, that pressure on our governments to be accountable when that happens so i think uh, basically off here that's what i think uh, thank you dr uh, thank you uh, collins uh, i think uh, mill mill is the man of the of the field and just hear from you uh, some practical and operable recommendation my friend Okay, thank you, Professor Lid. Uh, well, uh, uh, we have uh, regional economic cooperations in Africa uh, and everywhere under our African Union. And I think strengthening that uh, with the youth group is very important also. If it's not established, then it's good to establish also uh, in, 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 in these areas uh, so that they can oversee uh, some of the activities that the youth are undertaking in each country. And one is that one. And the other is, you know, uh, the major challenge for pro proliferation of weapons in Africa is countries within Africa, the neighboring countries are themselves who are really causing a problem among themselves. And through that, they smuggle and use are always victims of circumstances at the, at the forefront. And this is the biggest challenge now. Now, strengthening peace and security situations in each country and commitment among themselves to each other is very crucial. Africa Union and peace security should work toward that in terms of you know alleviating some of the challenges that uh, the, that countries are facing now. Uh, for instance, now uh, there is a that that in in Ethiopia it happened. For instance, the user the one who were victims uh, against you know the uh, the war in Tigray, for instance. And you know, youth are the one recruited. The same is true also the conflict between uh, Sudan and Ethiopia and the other countries as well. You know, youth are always victims of circumstances. And how do we really uh, change this behavior among within the continent? Shall we move towards you know uh, uh, economic integration or social integration? All these aspects are very important for us. I think we need to do something in a very wider context addressing the needs of all countries to meet uh, you know their equal uh, opportunities uh, so understanding among the, the, themselves is very important a regular discussion is very important and also proliferation of weapons which is coming to for instance in somalia which was the biggest challenge and uh, even there are people who are selling these weapons to them from the government officials and how do we handle these issues this is happening also in northeast North Nigeria, where Boko Haram is really active. And we know that how, I, I don't want to tell the history, one of the histories which was, which I knew about it when I was there uh, during the kidnapping of the girls, after the kidnapping of the girls, what happened. And these are some of the things, how do we solve and secure, you know, children's rights, even in the country. You know, kidnapping is happening by youth, it's not by elderly people. 
and this use are the one who are in the forests and this use, how do we need to bring back? We need to give them also a sort of, uh, you know, uh, 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 really permission to come in and also the government should really commit themselves to, uh, to bring them back to normal life and with a commitment. I think this is very important. If we work towards that, we can really solve some of these challenges. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm still waiting for a reaction from our ladies, Soliana, Singo, 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 uh, Rubiat, do you have a comment, Rubiat? Rubiat? Yes, Professor Lai. Yeah, go ahead. Or otherwise, ask your colleagues from uh, your la la the other ladies to ask question or to comment or make a comment. Well, I would prefer that allow me to give them the floor first and uh, I'll come back in later. Okay, uh, I want to ask, uh, I mean, it will be maybe the last question because we have another tw uh, 12 minutes left. Uh, my question, of course, to our friend from uh, uh, African Union Commission, will it be one day, uh, this is my uh, my guess, will it one day uh, we have a leader summit, will it be a youth leader summit uh, for the whole continent one day in Africa, my dear, uh, Hooks? Uh, I, I don't quite uh, understand your question. <laughs> no, the question is, we have so many uh, uh, summit for leader in this country, in the continent, leader state and uh, government and so forth will be one day uh, summit uh, exclusively for youth and the children for the whole continent so do you mean be like like having it as the theme for the the for the summit i mean i mean the, the idea is how to gather all leader uh, youth leader in the whole continent for a summit under the hospice of african union oh, all right okay okay um I mean, At least to give them a chance to think that they will be leader of tomorrow because they are already left out of uh, the mainstream. Yes, I mean, um, it's, it's interesting that you ask that because one of the um, really uh, activities that, you know, the Youth for Peace was looking to do uh, last year was to hold um, a, a, a sort of YPS summit uh, that would be you know, feed into the actual heads of state summit. So the outcomes would feed into it. Um, unfortunately, with COVID, um, you know, all, all yeah. plans had to had to had to change. Uh, for first and foremost, um, finances were diverted to towards the fight against COVID. And then secondly, of course, um, without um, um, with, with the pandemic, you know, there was no travel and also the summit itself was uh, then uh, uh, conducted uh, online uh, virtually. Um, uh, so this was a plan we had to have it as a side event, you know, that would be a, a, a couple of days before before the main uh, summit, and then the outcomes would fit into it, and then these young people would also be um, able to, you know, experience um, what the summit uh, is like and uh, what, what goes on there and how uh, decisions are taken and so on and so forth. Uh, but uh, what what we we did instead was to hold um, you know regional uh, virtual regional uh, summits on on the theme uh, SDG youth and SDG and the outcomes of this uh, fed into uh, the the deliberations of uh, both the ministers and uh, the heads of state assembly uh, on the on the summit on on SDG. Uh, let's let's see the way things uh, work out in the, uh, in, in the coming in the coming years. Uh, we, we're all uh, hopeful that we can go back to um, the old normal, or at least a new normal that will enable us um, carry out activities as 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 we are more used to. And then we can see how you know <laughs> this this uh, uh, youth uh, uh, continental uh, youth uh, peace builders. Uh, Forum can 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 actually be uh, implemented as as something, um, um, you know. I think I think it's a worthwhile uh, thing, and we 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 thought about it. So uh, let's see how we can bring that uh, to 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 implementation in the in the nearest future. Okay. Yes, let's keep a finger crossed. Since there is no uh, survey on this uh, webinar, we we appreciate to hear from all of you. 
personally what you think about the topic, the, th the thematic, and so forth. Can we hear any voice, those who have not spoken at all, like Munib, Ridyat, Misyud, and so forth? Is there any comments or any just suggestion or any question? Yes? Otherwise, uh, I have to hand it to uh, Rubiat uh, for the last uh, comments. Okay? Yes? Rubiat, the floor is yours, Rubiat. Uh, thank you, Professor Lai. Uh, this has been a very interesting briefing session, and I thank you very much for being our host, Professor Lai. A, a number of interesting points have been raised by the speakers and our participants as well, and it leaves us uh, with a, a number of assignments. And uh, this is just going to be the first uh, session of series on the youth and the children and their nexus with silence in the guns and we'll definitely come back with another one as it has left us with as i mentioned earlier a number of assignments dr rook saying thank you so very much for being here with us today from beginning to the end and of course natalie she had to leave and uh miss doris as well cannot be here with us to uh speak more on her involvement in the uh in the children's aspect but definitely we'll have another session with that and uh we will share with all of you the outcomes document shortly and i would like to kindly ask you all to uh, fill out uh, the survey we will share with you shortly after this and uh we will have another in Dawa session. The second in Dawa session will be held on Friday, on uh, Thursday. It will be with Her Ex Excellency Ellen Johnson Sirley, former president of Liberia. And I invite you all to join us again in this session. Thank you so very much for staying with us from the beginning to the end. And it has been a full two hours of very interactive and very interesting discussions. Thank you very much and have a great day. Thank you, everyone from Algiers. My regards to you. Thank you. Bye bye.